my heart and change my life. Say that again. Speak to my heart and change my life. Say it again. Speak to my heart and change my life. Come on. Speak to my heart. And change my life. Manifest yourself in me. Oh, manifest yourself. Let your glory come, Lord. Manifest yourself in me. Bring your power. Manifest yourself in me. <laughs> Woo! Come, Holy Spirit. I got news for the devil. I said, I got news for the devil. He's in trouble. Hallelujah, we're going to blow this thing again. We ain't putting up with nothing. I said, we ain't putting up with nothing. Hallelujah. I want to say to those of you that are here tonight and you're battling, you got a devil on your back and he's choking the life out of you, I'm going to tell you right now, there comes a time whenever other folks have to reach out to you and help you. We're going to help you tonight. Yes. And I'm going to tell you something else. Not only are we going to help you, but the Holy Ghost is going to help you. And I'll tell you what else we're going to do. You know, God will allow what we allow, and God will disallow what we disallow. And I just don't, I, I'm just serving notice right now on hell, we ain't going to allow nothing. Can you say amen? There were, there were several things that happened in the Old Testament whenever a shofar was sounded, and Dick's going to share two or three of them real quick. Number one, it was always used to bring up the glory of God. When you sounded the shofar, the glory of God came up to a higher level. 
And I was reminded by what Pastor shared with us, maybe some of you weren't here and you need to get the message about going up. You always went up to Jerusalem, and the glory was always brought up by the sound of the shofar. And you remember what happened when Gideon had his men sound the shofar? The enemy became so confused, the enemy began to destroy himself. Amen. A rabbi that lived in the 11th century, his name was Rabbi Isaac. He was a Rambam rabbi, he was a head rabbi. And he made the statement that if we don't blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the new year, that we'll have trouble all year with the devil because we haven't confused him. The rabbis even know the power of the shofar. There are two things that I find in, 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 in researching this, we're trying to write a book on it, is there are two things that, the, that, that we have as a power tool against the enemy, and that is the shout yeah. and the sound of the shofar. That's the destiny of the church. Can you say amen? I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> I just I just wish God would send us a more active crowd. I tell you folks, y'all are dead, dead, dead. I tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna shout, we're gonna we're gonna sound the shofar. And I want you to lift your voice. I don't care if you're Baptist and you're not used to this, or Methodist or Lutheran or Presbyterian, Catholic, Episcopal, or no, no, no religion. Assembly of God, whatever you are. I want you to lift up your voice as loud as you... I want you to bust them TV lights up yonder. I tell you what, let's lift up our voice in the chapel, in the cafeteria, in the choir room. Let's lift our voice. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to declare these, this whole campus a no-Satan zone. <laughs> I tell you what, I tell you what else we're going to do. By lifting our voice and by blowing the shofar, we're going to shatter the power of the devil, and we're going to scatter the power of the devil. So look, whenever we sound the shofar, whenever he blows it, you got them lips squeezed up, brother? All right. Whenever he sounds the shofar, I want you to lift up your voice, and I want you to shout, Jesus, praise God, hallelujah, anything you want to shout. But I want you to lift your voice and let's let the devil know we mean business. Come on. I want to share one thing. When I was little, my, I used to give my mom a lot of problems. A lot, I was a lot like Steve. And uh, I used to give my mom a lot of problems. She said, I'm just going to scream. And it, it's something about releasing. Amen. There's something about the shout and the releasing of your burdens. Can you say, how many ever had your mama say, I'm going to scream if you don't stop that? Amen. Well, that's where it comes from. I never was that bad. <laughs>
we're going to move on, but before we do, the pastor's asked me to sing something, I want to sing it, so I'm going to sing this real quick out of my spirit. Lift up your hands and sing it. Come on. Holy. Everybody, lift up your voice. Sing. Mine. 
And when you're passing through the water, please know that I will be with thee. And through the river, they shall not overflow thee. When you're walking through the fire, Sometimes when we go through things we don't understand, Lord, why do I have to go through this again? This is not the first time, Lord. I sense tonight, and so does Steve, that there's a lot of you under the sound of our voice here on this campus. You've come here, and many of you have come here out of desperation. You're desperate for a touch from God. I want you to remember what he's just singing. He said, though you walk through the waters, I'll be, everybody hold steady for just a moment. Though you walk through the waters, he said, I'll be with you. God will not let you drown. I want to tell you, friend, everything you go through is Father filtered. Everything you go through is Father yes, filtered. Yes, yes, everything. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Everything. Yes. You know, yes, yes. Sure everybody heard it. Okay. everything that you go through is father filtered god will not god will not allow the devil to turn up the fire hotter than what you can bear the bible says with every temptation he will make a way of escape every temptation not some of them not one of them slip by but with every one of them he will make a way of escape and i want to tell you something else one time i was studying about the potter and the potter's will Whenever that potter takes that clay and he begins to put it on the potter's wheel, that wheel represents life circumstances. It turns. Your life is always changing. It's always turning. It's never the same. You may wake up in the morning when your eyes come open from sleep and you may feel like, well, this is just another day. It's not another day. It's a different day. We're on a journey. We're moving. We're ever moving. Everything we go through is father filtered. And after the potter will take that clay, he will form it. Some of it will be low and squatty. Some of it will be tall and slender. Whatever he's forming, he's got a purpose for it. After he gets through with that, then he puts it in the oven. After he gets through forming what he's going to form, he puts it in the oven and he turns the fire up. But you know what he does? He never puts those vessels in that oven so close to one another because if he puts them in there close to one another, they will dry and they will mar and he'll have to break them and make them all over again. There's going to be things that you will go through in your life that you will have to go through it all by yourself. Even your wife or your husband can't be there to dry out with you when you're put in the furnace. Even your pastor can't be there with you. It's you and the Lord. And God's got that thermostat set on that furnace just right. And you know how he knows when you're through? He knows when you're completely cooked and you're ready now to be decorated and adorned. You're ready for medals to be hung on you. You're ready for gifts to be given. You're ready for ministry to be designated. So you know how he knows? That heat will rise in that oven. And as that heat rises, it'll dance. And that pottery will get so dry and so brittle until it'll cause a hum to come in that pottery. A shrill hum. And when that potter hears that clay humming in that heat, he'll say it's ready to come out. Friend, if you're going through hell, don't stop. If you're going through hell, don't stop. The Father, the Father has everything under control. Even the thermostat, he's got his eye on it. Jesus is so comfortable with you and what you're going through, he's not even standing. He's sitting. He's not concerned. Amen. Though the devil come in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. Hey, listen. He's going to sing this one more time, and we want to dedicate this tonight to every minister, every pastor, every evangelist and wife on this campus. I want everybody to stand. 
Lift up your hands and we're going to dedicate this to those that's going through the devil. Come on, sing it and let it just minister to you. Fear not for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by the name. Thou art mine. And when you walk in
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. The Lord is speaking to my heart just as Pastor came up here a moment ago and was talking about the fire. Uh, but the Lord gave me another uh, piece of information about the fire in Daniel, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, sometimes the fire gets out of control. And, uh, you know, the temperature just goes out of sight. And Nebuchadnezzar heated the furnace up so hot till the people had put those three boys in there, they died. But, uh, friend, let me tell you, those guys came out, and the Bible says there wasn't even the smell of smoke on them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God can not only preserve you, but he can keep you from smelling. Well, Isn't that wonderful? All right. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we're glad you're here tonight. This is revival, folks. Ah. Hallelujah. There's some folks, they're still in doubt. But, you know, we used to have a saying in the Navy, if it waddles like a duck and quacks like a duck and looks like a duck, it's a duck. Well, you know, neither us nor the critics have seen revival before, so we don't know what a duck looks like. But we have heard this duck quack, and we have seen this duck waddle. And so we just conclude that this must be a duck. Hallelujah. This must be a revival. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. We're so glad you're here. We're honored that you're here. And I know that uh, you've uh, paid a, a sacrifice, made a sacrifice to get here. And we understand that, and we're glad. And you're going to be blessed in a little bit. Uh, our evangelist is going to preach, and, and uh, conviction is going to fall in this place. And if you've never seen miracles, you're going to see miracles, hundreds of them, in just a little bit. You're going to see them. They'll come rushing to this altar. Last night was absolutely marvelous. I was over in the chapel, and we had people come forward over there in mass from the, the crowd that we had. And then uh, the, here, it was all the way up the aisle. And then after that, we're going to pray for all of you that are here that want a refreshing, and heaven's going to come down. I'm telling you, the best is yet to come, folks. Thank God for the worship and praise, but that just ushers in what God's going to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We're going to receive an offering right now. Praise God. We consider giving to be just as much a part of worship as anything else we do here. And uh, so we want to give you the opportunity to uh, help us with the expenses of the revival. And uh, if you look around, you see somebody that's laying in the floor or something like that. The first killing in, uh, in, in the history of mankind was over an offering. Did you know that? Sure was. Cain killed Abel. People still been having heartburns over offerings ever since then. But we don't have a heartburn over here. We just, we just consider it to be a joy to bring a portion of what God's committed into our care. And so we want to give you that opportunity tonight. And I want to tell you that the seed that you're sowing, represented by money, is going into very fertile ground. Uh, there are 93,000 souls plus that have been saved here over the last uh, 20 months or since June of 1995. And we praise God for that. Hallelujah. And we praise God for that. I don't know of any more fertile soil than, than the soil of this revival. And so we invite you to put your, your money where it will produce. And uh, you, you, you can't buy a soul, but what your money will do, it will provide a facility, it will provide lights and electricity and air conditioning and heat and guards for your cars and, and uh, babysitters for your children and uh, all of the things that are necessary for your comfort and for your well-being and for the well-being of those who come in to receive Christ. And that's what your, your dollars will buy. Only the blood of Jesus will redeem a soul. That's the only thing. But your money will provide an atmosphere in which that can happen. And so we're going to invite you tonight to uh, give in this offering. Our ushers are coming forward. And I want to just, the pastor told me to get a bunch of money in a short period of time. So I'm not going to dwell on this, but I just want to say one other thing before we pray, and that is this, that we do not want nor do we expect your tithe to be put into this offering, okay? If you're from another church, your tithe does not belong in this offering. So if you have tithe money in your hand now that you're about to put in this offering, please put it back in your purse or in your wallet. If you've written a check to Brownsville 
and that check is your tithe that should go in your, your church in Des Moines or somewhere like that, then uh, tear the check up. Uh, we don't want it. You shouldn't put it here. It should go where you're being fed. It should go into the local church where you uh, are a part. You might say, well, I'm, I'm angry with the pastor. I don't like the deacons. That's not the, the issue, folks. The money still goes into your local church. And so it has nothing to do with how you feel about the leadership. You, you, you just be in obedience and you be faithful and God's going to bless you and he'll take care of the leadership. Okay? So put your tithe in your local church, but we're receiving an offering tonight. So feel free to give $10,000 if you want to. <laughs> We'd love to have it. But just be sure it's an offering and not tithe. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight and we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, our eyes have seen the glory of God. And our ears have heard wondrous things, Lord. And we've experienced things beyond our wildest imagination just a few months ago. And we're so grateful to you, Lord, because you've blessed us exceedingly and abundantly above that that we could ask or think. And now, Lord, as we receive this offering, we ask you to bless those that are going to give it. And, Father, I just know that you love a cheerful giver and you always return in some way a blessing to those who give to you. There's no way in the world any one of us here could ever pay you for what you've done for us, and we don't even begin to try, Lord. We know it's a hopeless situation. But we just want to give expressions of love and praise and adoration to you. And part of the way we do that, Lord, is by giving some of the money which we've earned from our energy being invested in what we do. And so, Lord, we take this money very seriously. We know that it has been earned by the sweat of the brow and by the energy and time of your people. And we're very conscious of the stewardship obligation that's over us. And so, Lord, we take this very seriously, and we thank you for every dollar that will be given. And, Lord, we'll be careful to manage it correctly and expend it to your, for your glory. So, Lord, we bind this money now to the body of Christ, which is your church, and we commit every dollar of it to the furtherance of your kingdom and the glorification of your Son, in whose name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. everyone here. He knows everyone in the cafeteria, everyone in the choir room, everyone that's watching at home. And Lucifer, I'm going to say something to you right now. The Lord spoke to me about you this, this evening right as we began his service. And it's over. You've lost tonight. As a matter of fact, devil, I want to read something to you. You may have think, you may have thought that this was to the church of the Philippians, but this is, um, I want to read this to you, devil. Having this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Lucifer, you were there, you saw it. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every, every knee that
that's you, Lucifer. Every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. The other day, I preached last Friday night, as a matter of fact, a message entitled, No Other Name. And there is salvation, Lucifer, in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus. 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 The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Now I know, I want everyone to remain standing. I know we stand a lot in this place. I want to let you know something, friend, tonight. I want everyone to listen. We're bringing some of the folks from the overflow rooms in here. I want everyone to pay attention. This is not what I intended to do tonight. But I am so sick and tired of defeated lives. I want to tell you why I'm sick and tired of it, because it does not have to be that way. That's not how God intended you to live. He intended for you to live in victory. He intended for you to live a life in abundance. He intended, he intended for you to live with your head lifted up. The Bible says he's the glory and the lifter of my head. That's how the Lord intended you to live. And it's time, friends. Tonight the Lord spoke to me and I turned to pastor and God was speaking to him. There's going to be an authority that comes down in this place tonight unlike many of you have ever, ever experienced. I remember. I remember one time being in an Argentine meeting. And it was, I visited, this was 1984 before I learned Spanish. And I was in this large meeting and, and I, had, I had preached and the altar call was just incredible. People came forward. And there's this girl standing right in front of me. And I had not yet learned the language, so I was working through an interpreter. And I walked up to her, and I could tell that she was a witch. She just, I, you just knew that you knew. And just, there was fire in her eyes. And she, you could tell she hated me. And I looked around to my, uh, my associate, the one who spoke fluent Spanish at that time, and, and, I, and I couldn't find him anywhere. And so I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I've got to talk to her. I've got to find out what she's going through. I've got to find out who she is. I've got to find out what she's been battling with. And the Lord said, why? And it was like I said, you know, because that's what we do. You know? And, he, and then the Lord said to me, now this girl, was, she was from Argentina. She did not speak English. I could not communicate with her. And the Lord said, remember the day you got saved. You were saved by my name. Those of you that know my conversion experience, I was led to the Lord by a Lutheran vicar, an associate pastor of a Lutheran church. And he said to me, Steve, pray with me. And I said, I don't know how to pray. I was a drug addict and never prayed. And he said, Steve, just say the name Jesus. Just say the name Jesus. And I started saying that name after years of addictions and years of crime and years of just torment, years of hell. I began saying that name, Jesus. Jesus, I'm lying on the bed in my mom's home, looking up at the ceiling, going through, just at the end of everything, it was all over for me, and I just began screaming out that name, Jesus, 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 Jesus. You want to know something, friend? He didn't have to tell me the four spiritual laws. That man didn't have to lead me down the Romans road to salvation. That name broke through everything that I had ever been battling with. In a matter of 30 seconds, 
In 30 seconds, I was brand new. My mom's been here for the last three weeks, and she would testify to you how she watched me transform in front of her face. She saw the hard rock, stone-cold face just turn like a baby, like a child, and became a tender young boy again. Her child that had left her, you know, when you get into drugs, you stop, you stop growing emotionally. And suddenly, I was a child again, and I looked at her. I said, I love you, Mama. And I hugged her, and I kissed her. And that girl standing in front of me, I looked into her eyes, and the Lord said, just say my name. And I said, but Jesus, I don't even know how to say your name in Spanish. I had not even learned how to say Jesus. And he said, Steve, say my name. And I looked into her eyes, and I went, Jesus. And the power hit her. She was thrown backwards, thrown to the ground. She started spitting up. Foam started coming out the sides of her mouth. She started kicking and screaming. Ushers ran around her, started pinning her down. Then she was throwing them off. She kept pinning, they kept pinning her down. And I was going, dear God, that name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is salvation in the name of Jesus. There is no other name. Let me tell you what's about to happen. And this is a promise from the Lord. If you seek him, you'll find him. If you'll draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. If you resist the devil, he will flee. That is a promise. That is a promise. That is a promise in the word of God. If you will resist the devil, he will flee. This is what's going to happen tonight. You are going to have one opportunity and one opportunity only to resist him. I'm going to give an altar call in just a minute. I should have given it an hour ago. But I'm going to give an altar call in just a few minutes and give you the opportunity, those of you that are backslid, you are away from God, period, and you know it. Don't lie to me. Don't lie to the Holy Ghost. You know where you stand. The true test of a man's soul is when he's alone with God. You can look like a million bucks in front of a crowd of people, but what are you like when you shut the bedroom door and you're all alone? Who are you? You know if you're involved in pornography. You know if you're a lustful man and a lustful woman. You know what's plaguing you. You know that one sin that keeps dragging you down. Friend, there's going to be victory in this place. But it's up. I tell you what's watching. Who's watching this meeting tonight, friend? All the angels of the powers of heaven, but all the demons of hell. And they're watching you. See, you have always been the deciding factor. Because you are the vote. You are the vote, friend. You're the one that decides who wins and who loses. See, Jesus won the victory 2,000 years ago. That's settled. But you are still a free moral agent. You still have to choose. Am I going to choose Jesus or am I going to serve the devil? Am I going to let go of the hand of evil and take hold of the hand of God or try to hold on to both, which you cannot do, friend? You cannot serve God and mammon. It's impossible. But it's up to you tonight. And in just a minute... I'm going to give you an opportunity, those of you in overflow rooms, those of you that have come in here, I'm going to give you the opportunity to come to Jesus. Those of you that are unsaved, you have never met the Lord. Jesus Christ came. How, how simple does it have to be? Those of you that are unsaved in this room, I could probably have you come up here and share the gospel story. Especially during this season. We're between Christmas and Easter. That's when all Americans are thinking about God. It's the, it's the holy season. People are already just wheeling, winding down from Christmas cantatas, and now they're winding up again for the Easter cantatas. And here comes America. They can tell you the story, friend. He was, he, he was born a babe. He wasn't just a baby in a manger, friend. He was God Almighty. John the Baptist testified to him when he came walking towards him. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God had 
to provide a sacrifice. And if you wonder why you need a sacrifice, let me ask you something, friend, those of you that don't know the Lord in this place, when you do wrong, when you do wrong, do you feel bad? Of course you do. That's why we have people coming in here confessing crimes that have been hidden for years. They haven't even been caught. It's over, but they confess the crime. What's going on? Something's going on inside, friend. It's called guilt. And man's never been able to get rid of it. They tried it in the Old Testament. Read it for yourself. They'll kill a turtle dove. They'll kill a lamb. They'll sprinkle an offering. They'll do whatever they can to get rid of that guilt. But it, and it leaves for a minute or so, and then we're right back doing the same old thing. There's no change of heart. With a sacrificial lamb, all the offerings of the Old Testament were leading up. There was a bloodline, friend, from Genesis all the way to the time Jesus died. And it has to do, friend, with that one final sacrifice. Jesus said it himself when he hung on the cross. He said, it is finished. Now, there's a lot in those words, friend, but one of the things I know he meant was this. No more! Do you have to go to your flock and grab a little goat or grab a little lamb and have it, have it, have it cut open and, and spread the blood on the altar? No more do you have to do this and do that receive forgiveness of sins. From now on, all you have to do is look to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He has paid the ultimate sacrifice. And you want to know why? You want to know why he had to hang on the cross? Because that was the most cruel punishment the man could dish out so that covers everything no matter how bad you are murderer he paid the price robber he paid the price those of you that are just petty thieves little liars pornographers he paid the whole price he gave his life he went to death row for you friend all the way he went to the electric chair he went to the gas chamber he hung on the cross for you there's the gospel story now see that's been done Third day, he rose again from the dead. We're about to serve, uh, celebrate Easter. He rose again. There's, there's, no, there's no debating that issue, friend. Why? Because he lives in millions of people. He's everywhere. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. That, that's not even debatable. I wanna, I've worked in countries where if you talk about Jesus Christ not being alive, you look like a sheer fool because there's been so many miracles. In the name of Jesus, you say that Jesus ain't alive in some countries like Argentina, they'll look at you like you're from the moon. What are you talking about? He's healed me of cancer. He's delivered my family. He's set the nation ablaze. I mean, he did this, he did that. Friend, he's alive today. That's who he is. But it's time for you to choose. It's time for you to make up your mind. And there's power in this place tonight, friend. There is power, but it is up to you. See, I had on my Salvation Day, October 28th, 1975, I had a choice. That man came into my bedroom and said, say the name Jesus and he'll save your soul. I could have looked up at him and said, get out of my face. I could have jeered and ridiculed him, or I could have said to that man, come back some other day. It's all up to you, friend. The problem about hesitation is maybe there won't be another day. This is the day. Today is the day of salvation. So what's going to happen in this place in just a minute? I want all the folks in the chairs to move to the left and the right. Everyone else remain standing. Move to the left and the right. Charity, I want you to come. I'm telling you, we should have done this an hour ago. Forgive us, Jesus. But Holy Ghost, I know you haven't left. And devil, I can already see you shaking. Well, Brother Steve, I don't believe in the devil. Son, you're a fool. You're a fool. Who do you think's been speaking to you all your life? Who do you think reigns in the bars and the taverns? Who do you think is leading all that, friend? Who do you think whispers in your ear at night saying to you that you've been with your wife long enough? Why don't you find another woman? Who do you think that is? Who do you think is the one that parades that other woman in front of you? You call it providence? No, friend. It's hell. It's hell on the move. 
He knows he's dying. He knows he's going down. And like a drowning man, he's going to take as many people down with him as he can. Don't be one of them. He knows where he's going. He knows these scriptures. I just reminded him of them. He knows these scriptures. He can't stand these scriptures. At the name of Jesus, he knows one day, friend, it's going to be over. But tonight, you're going to seal something. Those of you that are away from God, you're going to seal something. You're going to have to do it quickly tonight. Everyone listen. Those of you in the overflow room, I want you to listen. Once again, Jesus, forgive me for not doing this an hour ago. If anyone left this place, Lord, that I should have called out, forgive me, Jesus. And God, if they're at Shoney's or they've left out or they've done something, maybe they got up and walked out, would you, Holy Spirit, get a hold of them where they're at? Would you do that, Lord? Because this is so serious. This is life and death. This is not about food and raiment and where we're going to live. This is about heaven or hell. Life and death. I'm going to give you the opportunity, to, friend, tonight to come to Jesus. We're going to do something we've never done in this revival before. Rather than charity starting this revival, this, this altar call, I'm going to have Lindell play a key uh, on the keyboard, a chord on the keyboard, and I'm going to have Dick Rubin. He's going to sound the shofar. Now, we've never done this. For those of you that have come to criticize this revival, stick around for a couple weeks. You'll become a believer. As a matter of fact, why don't you just spend a couple weeks with some converts? It's amazing how the critics are so scared of converts. They never want to talk to converts. They just want to sit back with their little notebook. But they never want to go to the homes of converts. It's amazing. Why? Because they might find out they've been transformed in this revival. Their lives have been changed. I love you, critic, but I hurt for you. I hurt for you because the Great Awakening is coming to America. And there's going to be two books written, those that were in it and those that were out of it. And when you get old and you have a grandchild sitting on your knee and you're bouncing that young boy up and down and he says this to you, Poppy, what was it like back in America in the late 1990s during that Great Awakening? Talk to me, Poppy, about when 100 million Americans received Christ. And you're going to want to say, I was in the middle of that. I saw so many come to Jesus. I was right there with God running forward. Or you can be one of those that said, you can hang your head in shame and say, I criticized it all the way through. I missed God all the way through that meeting. All the way through the revival that swept the nation. Hit the White House. Hit the government palaces. Hit it all. I criticized it all the way through. Don't be that person. You can make up your mind right now. You ain't going to be that person. Don't be one of those that I read in my books in my library. I have so many old books, and I read all these stories of these men that came against Whitfield, came against Wesley, came against Moody, came against Finney, came against William Seymour, came against, came against Edwards. Anybody that did anything, there's somebody there that blasted their name. Don't be one of those. What kind of name is that in the history, the annals of history? Your name is there as the one that fought John Wesley. Name is there as the one who, who spat upon Charles Finney. You were the one that said D.L. Moody was never going to be successful. You were the one that said he would never lead anybody to God in England. You were the one that said William Seymour was never involved in a move of God. You were the one that said that was all, that was all antichrist at Azusa Street. You were the one, friend, don't be like that. Be one of those that fans the flame. I feel it right now. This is what you're going to do. Everyone who is backslid, look at me in the balcony, those of you on the stairwell, everyone who is backslid, that means you are doing things that Jesus would never do. You're watching things. You're listening to things. You're involved in things that Jesus would never do. You know, backslider, when you're away from God. I'm going to give you the opportunity in just a minute to snap those chains and break away from the devil. You're going to resist him. He already knows the name Jesus. But he's got one more ace, and that is your decision. He knows the name of Jesus breaks every power that he's got. 
every chain, every shackle, everything that he's ever had as a tool, as a weapon against you is broken in the name of Jesus. But he's got one more thing, and that is your opinion, your decision. That's what he's got. Whether you make up your mind to turn at him and say, I'm sick of you. I'm sick of the drugs. I'm sick of the alcohol. I'm sick of my destroyed marriage. I am sick of the, the havoc you've played on my life. He can, he's going to stand there tonight and go, all right, so you're sick of it. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? It's a showdown, friend. I've been there. I've done that. You stick your finger in his face. This is what I'm going to do. I'm out of here. I'm going to resist you. I'm turning from you tonight. The Bible says if I resist you, you will flee. And devil, I want you to listen to this five-letter name. Jesus. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And you, my friend, you, you are going to come tonight. You're going to come quickly because let me tell you what's going to happen in the spirit realm. As soon as you decide, you have got a split second in eternity to move out. That's your moment in spiritual history to move out. Because if you hesitate tonight, if you're unsaved and you hesitate, friend, what you're saying to the devil is, I'm still thinking about it, Lucifer. You know what he's doing? I know you're kind. You're a piece of cake. Unstable as water, you shall not excel. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He knows all them scriptures. I've got you, he'll say. Go ahead, hesitate. Don't worry about it. Get it right tomorrow. Sunday's coming up. Get it right on Sunday. Goodness. Easter cantatas are coming up. Give it a couple months and get right with God at a cantata. But you don't need to do it right now. Friend, when you do that, there's a shackle around your ankle, and it's going to close tighter. You'll feel it. You'll feel his clutches come down on you, and you'll feel like you missed the opportunity of a lifetime. Leonard Ravenhill used to say to us, this is one of the last things he said to me before he died. He said, Steve, when revival breaks out, remember this, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. That means there's a moment in history when the door opens, Get in, run with it, Steve. Run with it. Run with it. That's why I'm here today. Because the door opened on Father's Day, 1995. We all saw it. It was the opportunity of a lifetime to see America changed. And now we're watching it with our own eyes. We're seeing people by the thousands. Thousands running to the cross. Friend, this is your opportunity. You're going to have to do the same thing. Those of you that are religious in this place, look at me. Your religion is absolutely, positively worthless. The devil has masterminded the religion of America. And I want to tell you something else the devil has done. You can get upset at me, friend, if you want to. He has helped us with some of our building programs. I believe without a doubt the devil has. I believe he's, he's raised the money himself for the steeple. Anything that he can do to keep us stayed, to keep us cold, to keep us happy in our little stained glass four-walled cavern. He's thrilled to death. And I can see him nudging some millionaire in the church that's half backslid going, I'll give him another half a million. Let's get this building up. Let's get the thing up. Stand up and say you'll give a half a million. Get the glory. And another facility is slapped up and the devil goes, good. Now if I can just keep him there on Sunday morning for an hour, I guarantee you the devil works overtime on Sunday morning, friend. He's the one that gets you to church. He gets America to church because he knows that Sunday is all they need to pacify their little religious itch. And you'll watch. You'll watch some of them on Sunday putting up, literally enduring the service. Getting out before they get in the car, they've already cursed their wife. And if it didn't happen in the car, by the time they get home, 
They're popping the top of a beer can, or they're sitting in front of some filthy movie, and here they go again. What did that mean? That meant absolutely nothing, but they think everything's okay. Why? Because they're a member of First Baptist. Because they're a member of Brownsville Assembly. They're a member of First Assembly. Friend, don't fall for it. I'm going to ask you tonight, do you know him? You know, the Bible says Jesus knows those who are his. Some of you, I'm asking you, do you know the Lord? Does he know you? Do you fellowship one with the other? Religious person, don't tell me about what you believe. I want to ask you this, who do you know? Do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? If you don't, friend, you don't know him. An Episcopalian lady came up to me the other day and she said this, I know why people are changing in your revival. I said, why? She said, because they're being confronted. She said, we never get confronted. That's what she said to me. She said, we never get confronted about we believe, what we believe. She said, I've been in this meeting one time, one meeting, and she said, I've had to question everything about myself. I've had to ask myself, do I know him? That's why people are changing here, friend. It's good to examine yourself. Paul said, examine yourself to see if you are really in the faith. Look inside. Don't say, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Baptist, I'm an Assembly of God, I'm this, I'm Pentecostal, I'm Methodist. No, friend. Ask yourself a good question like this. Do I know you, Jesus? Am I anticipating your appearing? Am I looking for your appearing? Do I think about you during the day? Are you on my lips? Do I love on you during the day? Do I worship you and praise you? Do I know you, Jesus? Do we have intimate fellowship one with the other? Those are the questions, friend. Not whether or not your choir robe is pressed. That's not the point. Trying to work on religion right now, brother. And I'll tell you what. It'll damn America. It's damning America. Went home the other night. And I was so tired I couldn't sleep, so I turned on the Discovery Channel or whatever it was. We watch those Discovery and those little newsy channels and, you know, with animals and stuff like that. And they're clean as a whistle, trust me. <laughs> and there was Walter Cronkite. It was called Wal Cronkite Remembers. And he, he, he stuck his finger out like this. He goes, America is getting religious. He said, 94% of Americans believe in God. 84% of Americans believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, believe that in the Christian faith. And here's Walter Cronkite. Those are the same statistics we've been getting you, we've been sharing with you. 84% of Americans, friend, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Look at this nation. Something's wrong, friend. Give me a break. That's religion. That is religion. 80% of Americans believe they're going to stand before God on Judgment Day. These are the latest Gallup polls. 80% of adult Americans believe they're going to stand before God on Judgment Day and be held accountable for their sins. While they're answering the phone to the Gallup poll people, they're drinking a bottle of wine and smoking on the cigarette and planning the next escapade. And they know that they're going to stand before God on Judgment Day. Friends, it's time for somebody to speak. It's time for somebody to raise the standard. Devil, I'm telling you tonight, you lose. You're not going to smoke us. You're not going to smoke us. There's not going to be no smoke screen. You lose. So those of you, those of you that are away from God, those of you in this room that are backslid, those of you in this room that do not know Jesus, you might be religious, but you don't know the Lord. Dick Rubin is going to sound the shofar. When this shofar is sounded, now don't get weird on us, friend. You know, well, they sound this horn all the time. No, we don't. You haven't been here, have you? Every once in a while, we'll sound the shofar. But I love it. I tell you what, the devil's heard this thing before. He's heard this thing. He's going, where did they get that? And on top of that, there's a Jew blowing it. Yeah. 
And may I add, may I add, Lucifer, a Messianic Jew. That means, devil, you lost one right here. This man has bowed his knee, just like the book of Philippians said, to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's met the Messiah. As soon as this is sounded, those of you that are away from God, those of you that are being plagued with sin and you want to shake that sin off of you, those of you that are backslidden, that is what you are, friend. If you're sinning, you are backslidden. Or you've never known the Lord. There's only a couple categories you can be in. Okay? Look at me, folks. There's no such thing as just a little bit of sin. I'm just going through a bad time. Dear God, friend, I hope God doesn't come back during your bad time. I'm just going through a dry spell. What are you doing during that dry spell, friend? Living like the devil during the dry spell? Right. No, friend, it doesn't work like that. You ca call it backslidden. Mm -hmm. As soon as this shofar is sounded, everyone who's away from God, everyone who's never known the Lord, everyone who has sin in their life, as soon as this is sounded, you're going to have a matter of a few seconds to step out and get right with the Lord. Fall on your face down here. Resist the devil and he will flee in the name of Jesus. Stay on this show bar right now. Come on, right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Keep your heads down. Dear God, I hear it. Devil? Wow. Glory. I'm going to do it one more time, friend. Now, we have never done this in the revival. For those of you that are taking notes and said, and now they blow the show far, and now people come forward. No, friend, we've never done this. Probably never will again. But right now, this is what the Lord is doing in this place. We're going to blow this one more time. But before we do, I am going to rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus from your life. And you, if you are not down here, I'm going to rebuke the devil, and then as soon as I finish, he's going to sound the shofar. If you don't step out, friend, this prayer right here will unloose those shackles. But if you don't step out, I want to tell you why it's going to loose the shackles. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I am not in sin. I'm living for God. I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, and strength. The devil knows my name. I am known in hell, and I'm going to speak to him right now in your favor. I'm going to tell him to let go of you, to let the chain snap open, and it's going to happen, and you better come. You better come. Devil, Satan, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Cristo Jesus, in the name of the Cristo Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we bind you. I bind you. I bind you from their lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, right now. Come on.
is the moment. Hurry right now. do not move. Keep your heads down. Those of you at the altar. Keep your heads down. This is confession time. Pour your heart out before the Lord. Pour your heart out. Pour your heart out to the Lord. Lord, forgive me. Wash me clean, Jesus. Wash me clean, Jesus. Cleanse my heart, Lord. Cleanse my heart, Lord. I confess my sin to you, Jesus. Lord, wash me clean. Wash me clean. It's a personal thing, friend. Go after him alone. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. My Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus, 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 there's something about the name of Jesus. Jesus, Lord, wash, wash us clean, Lord. He'll forgive you backsliding, friend. He'll come into your life tonight, friend. Don't leave this altar area. I want everyone to stay right here. God's not finished. There's a man in here that's in bondage to a sin that you've been plagued with since you were a teenager. You're going to hear some cries go out right now for you, friend. You better step out of your pew. 
You better step out of the balcony and come as quickly as you can. This is for you, friend. You better break away right now. Step out right now. Hurry. Hurry. God bless you. Hurry. Hurry. God bless you. Hurry. What are you waiting on, friend? You're waiting on God to speak to you. He's speaking to you right now. Come on. That was two, but there's more. There's more. Step out. In the cafeteria, step out. God bless you, sir. The Lord spoke specifically to me. You've been plagued with since your teenage years, and you can't shake it. If you'll step out right now, you're going to feel the power of the Holy Ghost come all over you, friend. You're going to have strength from above. Step out right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Yeah, come on. God bless you, yeah. God bless you, sir. Congregation, I hope you're praying. I hope you're not looking around. I hope you're praying. There's a warfare going on in here. We just had over 10 men come forward. Come on. Come on. God bless you. God bless you, both of you. going to set you free if you will step out friend step out god bless you that's 15 that have come out come on come on this is the day this is the hour this is your moment friend but you gotta move you gotta move god bless you sir come on god bless you come on down you're doing right coming quickly Come on. I just heard a lady say, well, what about me? All right, it's open for you right now. You've been plagued since the teenage years with something, and you haven't been able to shake it, man. Step out right now. Step out right now. Step out right now. Step out. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We've had 25 men come forward already. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. Whoa! Whoa! Devil, you lose! You lose! You lose! You are defeated! Friend, if you think it's just emotionalism, you're wrong. We've been here since Father's Day of 95. We've seen some stuff. We've seen some stuff, friend. This is a movement of the Holy Ghost. If you're coming. You better come within the next 60 seconds. I'm going to close the altar. You have 60 seconds. You better step out now. Hurry. Hurry. Somebody here. I want you to listen to something. I want you to listen to this. During the service tonight, the Lord spoke to my heart while we was on the platform, and he said that there's, there's an individual here, maybe more than one, but you've been tormented for a long time by hearing voices of demons. They torment you. They torment you. There's no rest for you. You're tormented, and just about the time you think that it's quieted off and they're mute, here they come again. The Lord said he wants to shut those voices off and free you and deliver you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Listen, don't anybody leave from this altar area. This is so powerful. Most of you are having, you haven't budged. There's one or two and you're sort of fidgeting around. I don't want anyone to leave because there's going to be a finish. There's going to be a seal on this tonight. There's going to be a seal and you need the sealing. You need the, you need the Holy Spirit to seal what's going on in here. But whoever you are, you've been plagued with these demons. 
and you're wondering, when's God going to help me on this? Friend, can't you see what's going on in this service? The message, well, God bless you. God bless you, sis. You're in the right place. God's going to take care of you tonight, sis. Does anyone else hear? You better come quickly. I'm going to wait for another service where God's going to touch me like this. Friend, this is an unusual service for you. Why don't you step out? This whole service is about the authority over the devil. This whole service is about the name of Jesus versus the name of Satan. You've got 60 seconds if you're the one. Come on, yeah, God bless you. Hurry, 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 hurry. You've got 55 seconds. Come on. This is the day of the glory of the Lord. seconds, 13, 11, don't miss it, friend, God bless you, 9, 7, God bless you, 4, 3, 2, God bless you, altar, I want you to bow your head. The door swung open again, friend. He's the God of the second chance. You better get down here right now. Those of you in the cafeteria, those of you in the other rooms, I want you to get down, get on your face before the Lord. Come on down, sis. Friend, you're going to be one miserable person if you leave out of here without responding if you know you're supposed to respond. We've had people stay up all night long and call the church the next day and ask us if it's too late to get saved, if it's too late to get right with God. Tormented all night long. Couldn't sleep. God bless you. God bless you. Let's pray. Everyone at the altar, I want you to bow your heads and pray. Everyone at the altar, I want you to bow your heads and I want you to pray. This prayer is for everyone that's backslid. God bless you, ma'am. You came just in time. This is for everyone that's backslid, everyone who's never known the Lord, everyone who is religious, but you don't know Jesus. This is for every one of you that need forgiveness at this altar. I want you to pray, and I want to tell you, this has been authoritative night. You will not whisper tonight, friend. You're going to pray this prayer out loud. Will the devil hear me when I pray just softly? Of course he will. Will the Lord hear me if I don't even open my mouth and I just sing the prayer? He knows every thought and intent of your heart. He knows, friend, but there's something when you vocalize it, something happens. We just heard tonight about the shout, the power of the shout. 
There's something to be said. Smith Wigglesworth, one of the greatest preachers of this deck of this century, he loved to shout. He said every God, every, every man and woman of God should learn how to shout. Learn how to shout. I want everyone at this altar, I want you to pray out loud with me this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me. Tonight, I resist the devil. And according to your word, he has fleed. I ask you tonight, Jesus, to forgive me, wash me, cleanse me. I have sinned. I have hurt you. I have hurt others. And I've hurt myself. Forgive me, Jesus. I repent of my sins. Wash me clean. Make me new. I turn around. I change. I'm letting go of the hand of evil and taking a hold of the hand of God. Tonight, Jesus, be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. Tonight, Jesus, I am 100% yours, and you are 100% mine. I give myself to you. You can count on me in your precious name. In the name of Jesus. Let's say that a little bit louder there, friend. In the name of Jesus. In the name.